While some people find ethical relativism very appealing, there are, of course, some serious problems with it. Otherwise, I would have simply said, ethical relativism, the correct moral view, we're done. So here are some classic kind of stock problems with ethical relativism, in terms of criticisms. The first one is that relativism seems to refute its own tolerance argument. That is to say that we saw the argument that relativism is appealing because it would seem to lead us to be tolerant. But sort of ironically, it actually undercuts tolerance. So how does this objection work? Well, suppose we assume relativism is true, that morality is relative to each culture. So it would follow then that if a culture lacked a principle of tolerance, it would, of course, have no obligation to be tolerant. And relativists would have no basis for criticizing those cultures who are intolerant because the intolerant cultures are just as right as the tolerant ones. And a relativist cannot rationally criticize anyone else who advocates what they advocate as terrible principles. Again, the whole point of cultural relativism, its definition is that morality depends on the culture. And this seems to sort of ironically uh, self-destruct the tolerance argument because tolerance would require objective moral principles and ethical relativism says there's no such thing. And although an individual culture could embrace tolerance, it has no grounds on the viewpoint of the ethical relativist for criticizing any other culture. Which leads to the second problem. Relativism would preclude cross-cultural criticism. So if engaging in valid, meaningful criticism supposes an objective or impartial standard, relativists cannot morally criticize anyone outside of their own culture. Now, within the culture, criticism is is fine. One can can point out that people within one's culture are not living up to the professed values of that culture. That's perfectly fine. But again, ethical relativism is by definition the view that morality depends on the culture, and so one cannot criticize a culture from within another culture. To use an analogy to, to law, while someone in, say, one country may be, you know, look at laws in other countries as, as bad, they really can't, you know, say that those other laws are illegal because their laws would be just as legitimate as the laws in any other country. And so creates that problem. So anything that a culture regards as good, another culture could regard as evil. So in, nothing itself is inherently wrong or right. Racism would only be wrong if a culture believed racism is wrong. Same for genocide, oppression, slavery, murder, etc. All are equally good. It all depends on where you happen to be. Another problem is that it leads to some consequences. Uh, one is, is that it would seem to entail that reformers would always be wrong because they go against cultural standards. So anyone who is looking at the, an existing culture and saying these values are, are bad, they are automatically wrong themselves. Now, of course, if they succeed and manage to change the values, then they would you know, transform from being wrong to not being right. Now, one could say this, this is perfectly reasonable and they could use an analogy to law. If someone is opposed to a law, and doing, you know, breaking it and doing illegal things, but then they go and get the law changed so that what was previously illegal is now legal. Well, now it's legal. Now they're doing the legal thing. A second consequence is that it would seem to be that if you base the culture on the numerical majority, which is only one way, of course, of defining it, is that the majority would always be right. And the numerical minorities are always wrong. So on this view that culture is defined by numerical majority, then they decide what is right and everyone else is would always be wrong. And again, one could, one could say, hey, this is not really a problem. If you look at, for example, the way that 
elections work, at least in theory, is that the majority, what they decide is set as, you know, is what is chosen and what the minority, numerical minority wanted is not. And so you could think of if, if our law works in that, you know, majority rule, then that's exactly how law would work. The majority sets what's legal, again, in theory, and the numerical minorities do not. Now, I've sort of been broadly, vaguely saying, you know, culture, culture, culture. But a good question is, what what is a culture? Now, we have kind of a vague idea. We talk about, say, French culture or American culture or Southern culture or New England culture. But the notion of a culture or society can be very difficult to define. Especially when you have societies, you know, a complex culture, which pretty much all of them are, where you have conflicting moralities. And so a person who's a member of, you know, multiple cultures, which is pretty much all of us, we would be both right and wrong, whatever we presumably do. I mean, take, for example, the United States. Uh, currently, as I'm recording this, abortion is morally accepted by most Americans who, or at least they're willing to, to say that it should be legal. And of course, various states are, you know, attempting to address the legality of it. But currently, as this is being recorded, you might say that American cultural morality is that abortion is at least morally tolerable. But if someone is a member of a, of a group that's very much anti-abortion, as an American, part of the American culture, they would be, behold, if for relativists, they would have to accept that the abortion is more morally tolerable. But if they're, say, you know, very religious and they espouse anti-abortion views within that group, and a member of that group as well, then, of course, for that culture, that society, abortion would be wrong. And so someone would both be, you know, they would both be right and wrong, depending on what, which culture you look at. And you could do this for a huge range of views. You could take the broad, say, professed American moralities about, you know, truth, justice, and the American way, and then look at people who belong to various groups that explicitly go against those, those values. And they're all members of these various cultures. So how do you decide what is right or wrong if you base morality entirely on culture and society? And the answer would seem to be difficult. Now, one could attempt to various you know, workarounds because there are smart people who support ethical relativism, so they try to solve these problems. You could do kind of an analogy to law where just as like in the United States, federal law supposedly you know, trumps state law, which trumps local law. And you could say that you know, one must accept, say, the dominant American morality. And so all the lesser groups are just you know, mistaken. Or you could do the reverse. And have like the smaller groups, you know, they're the ones. If you're in, in the smaller group, then you get uh, you get that. And kind of the challenge would be working out in a principled way uh, which group correctly defines which morality. Now, this leads to the next problem, which is the criticism that relativism kind of weirdly cannot even exist, that it's an impossibility. How so? Well, here's the reasoning. The idea is that relativism ends up collapsing into subjectivism because, going back to the previous problem, there doesn't seem to be any principled way of defining a culture. You're going back to the problem in the United States. Uh, if, you're, if you're an American, you belong to, like, American culture. But you'd also presumably partake of the culture of the, the state where you, you live or grew up. And then, of course, you would almost certainly belong to various smaller groups, which would have, you know, differing values as well, depending on, you know, things like religion, hobbies, you know, uh, fraternities, sororities, clubs, uh, political parties, etc. And if we try to sort this all out, it would seem that anyone could be a culture of one. I mean, if we consider, say, the whole United States a culture, but then you could imagine, you know, kind of like an apocalyptic scenario where all Americans except, you know, one um, parish, and we have one American left, the last American, and they, of course, would be American culture. 
So there seems to be no principled way to say that you couldn't have a culture of one. So the challenge is drawing those boundaries. What is the boundary between cultures? And it would seem that you can't do that. And so each person could legitimately be their own culture. Now, one could, of course, attempt to argue against that and try to argue that it is possible to define a culture in a meaningful way, but that's the collapse argument. But wait, things seems to get worse. So if a relativism cannot provide a way to, in a principled way, define a culture, so anyone could be their own culture, that in effect creates subjectivism in the sense that if each person is their own culture, then morality depends on each individual, and by definition that is subjectivism. And things get worse, because the next argument in subjectivism uh, is not being left out. You might have wondered when we're getting to subjectivism, and here we are. And one of the classic problems of subjectivism is that it seems to collapse into moral nihilism. How so? Well, for the subjectivist, morality seems to be a matter of like of taste. I use the analogy to, to food. What you find yucky or yummy all depends on you. It's entirely subjective. And if morality is subjective, well, it entirely depends on you. So it seemed to be a matter of taste. What you find regard as evil is evil because you regard it as evil. What you regard as good is good because you regard it as good. Now, if we accept that sort of subjectivism, then there'd be no, no way to resolve moral disputes because there's no common ground. Everyone is right. But then, of course, it means everyone is wrong. Now, using an analogy to, to law, this would be like if everyone could make their own law whenever they wanted to. And that would, would in fact, totally destroy law because the whole point of law is that at least in theory, is that it applies to like at least groups of people. Now, morality is like law is supposed to assist us in resolving our conflicts. And if morality is just entirely subjective, everyone's right, but also everyone's wrong. And it can't help us at all unless by pure, say, chance, two people happen to to agree that something is good or bad. And this theory of morality seems to be, you know, kind of incoherent. So this ends up collapsing into morality in effect is nothing. When we're saying the words good and bad, we're really saying this in, in essence, nothing at all. At best, we'd be saying, you know, that each person would be kind of saying they like or dislike something. But in effect, morality becomes, you know, meaningless and empty and hence collapses into nihilism. So probably the one of the most powerful objections against relativism is that it, in a way, can't even exist. And the same with subjectivism. It can't exist either, because if the arguments work, relativism collapses into subjectivism, and then subjectivism collapses into nihilism. And so it's not that they're necessarily wrong, it's that they can't even exist. The final bit on relativism we uh, began by looking at the argument involving the diversity thesis, independency thesis, getting us to relativism. And this argument can, of course, be criticized. First, the diversity thesis. And as you might recall, that's the thesis that moral principles are not shared between different cultures. Now, this is an empirical, you know, matter. It's something we can investigate and look at what people say. So it does seem that although people do vary, there do seem to actually be some universal moral principles. Now, there are probably no principles that every single person in existence agrees upon, because all we need is one person out of billions to disagree. But a pretty good case can be made that humans, you know, broadly agree that things like, you know, murder is bad, stealing is bad. Uh, we generally agree about those things. And obviously people disagree like when and when killing is appropriate and when stealing could be okay and not okay. But generally, if you were to ask people, would you think it'd be morally fine for you to be murdered? People will say, well, no. Uh, 
And so it does seem that we do broadly share moral principles. So the idea that there are no universal moral principles, I mean, again, it's true that not every single person holds, you know, the moral principles, but they do seem to be very broadly shared. And one might point to cultures that have radically different morality that seem to, you know, believe that, you know, murder is okay or lying is okay or theft is okay. But interestingly, one can point to the fact that these cultures seem to not, not really last. Uh, they don't, I mean, true that you could say they, they exist. And one could make the point this shows that morality you know, moral principles are not universal because look, there's a few people who, who don't, don't believe this, but in general, the broad societies, the, the ones that endure seem to share at least some principles. And again, this is an empirical, empirical fight. Secondly, for the dependency thesis. Now you could accept a degree of dependency and you know, accept the aversion of this principle. How so? Well, an alternative is to define dependency thesis in a way in which cultures do vary in their application of morality, but they're operating on similar principles that even though a person may focus on the differences, there's a core morality. So you might say that even though the application or behavior varies from culture to culture, there's still a basic core there. For example, going back to the story of Herodotus, of the Greeks and the Calate, uh, the Greeks, of course, burned their dead. The Calate supposedly ate their dead, but they have a core moral principle. The core moral principle is treating the dead with respect. And if a person believes that burning the dead is proper respect, that is showing respect. If a person believes that consuming the bodies of their dead shows respect, then they're operating on that principle of respect. So one could argue that there is a core morality that manifests in different ways, which makes it consistent with moral objectivism. And so one could accept the diversity thesis. One could accept a version of the dependency thesis, but still embrace objective morality. And so that takes us to the end of ethical relativism and subjectivism.